all US American anthropology textbooks for cultural anthropology, you'd have a language chapter coming around at this time. And so that would come in. Um, but interestingly, here in this chapter, they don't start off with language. They start off with classification and then uh, the rationality debate and the witchcraft stuff. So that stuff usually in US American anthropology would probably happen later, maybe in a religion section or a, some other part of, of, of life. And so I'm interested that they put that here and I like it in the sense that uh, it gives us this idea from the beginning that maybe language has more to do with thinking than it does perhaps with communicating. As I say, of course, language is important for communication, but did the urge to do things from humans grow out of this idea of humans as classifiers or trying to explain the things that happen in the world? Is that perhaps a better origin story for language than simply this idea we had to go from like grunting at each other and then that evolved into hello, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so I thought that was a, a really interesting way to organize the chapter. But at the last minute, I decided to switch it up to basically kind of how we do this in US American, which would be to do the language stuff first, because it's hard for me to imagine doing classification and explaining stuff if we don't have words yet. So we're gonna switch up the order of how we present this stuff in the chapter. We'll, we will first start with the language, why and how, uh, and then we'll go into language and culture, some of that stuff about uh, you know how, how language and culture are intertwined, and then we'll go back and, and into the classification and explaining stuff. So that was my, uh, that's my modification for how we'll, we'll present the material in this chapter. So, like I said, uh, this stuff has been the source of, of many deep thoughts in, uh, in our lives. A lot of stuff that people late night at dorm rooms everywhere have thought about the relationship between language and and society and if we're real and how and you know one of the things that is interesting about language and this is something you might maybe struggling with right now as you try to write your essay or other papers if if language is all about communicating our thoughts then why does it always seem to be so difficult to put our thoughts or our feelings into words i mean that's a huge challenge right so try and you know, tell somebody that you love them, very difficult to do. These feelings and thoughts seem hard to put into words. So if it's really about communication, then why is it so difficult? And I want to mention an article that has always kind of fascinated me and it's sort of, uh, it, it's in some ways a prelude to some of the things we'll be talking about later. The article was called, How Much Grammar Does It Take to Sail a Boat? And basically what our author was saying is that actually to run any modern society, any, even, a, even a quite, what we might consider a quite complex modern society, it actually doesn't take that much grammar to do it. And so if that's true, why are human languages more complicated than they need to be? They seem to be overbuilt for the situations that they encounter. And as a parallel to that, they seem to do some things, or they seem to force us to do things that we don't want to do. Uh, this has been a challenge recently, of course. They force us, for example, to specify the gender often of someone we're talking to or about. And so our language kind of pigeonholes us into that. We've been trying to look for a way out of that uh, with some success, but perhaps some anxiety too. Uh, and then there are other things that language would be really useful for that it really can't do. 
uh, the author here gives the example of it would be really nice if in just a, a few short words, you could describe someone so that you could pick them out of a crowd. And we can't, there's no way. It's just our language can't do that. So why does our language overbuild for certain things? Why are languages kind of overly, com overly complicated for what they need to do? And why can't they do what we want them to do when we need them to do it? So again, these are some sort of deep thoughts, which leads us into the first part, or what I'm gonna make the first part of this chapter, which is about symbolism, what they call shallow and deep. So, um, I guess I will just say here that this is, this again is, are, are terms that, that, that are a little bit new to me. Of course, we know about symbolism, when we use some kind of symbol, letters, words, sounds, to stand for something else. And uh, traditionally, I guess in, in most anthropology, we would call what they're calling shallow symbolism, uh, a kind of uh, the closed call systems that we see in non-human animals, where we would say that the same sound uh, has to stand for the same thing, and it kind of has to be present in that environment. So a call for danger, for example, of a chimpanzee has to be that sound and can't signify, say, future danger, or talk about danger that's in the past. It has to be danger now. And so this is what we refer to as closed call systems, because they don't have that property we'll talk about in a second of generativity. They don't have what we also call displacement, or again, you can talk about hypotheticals, you can talk about things that have already happened, you can talk about things that you think are going to happen. Um, these seem to be absent from the, what our authors call the shallow symbolism of non-human animals. And uh, well, let's pause for a second there. Lexi, you seemed a little bit suspicious of this line between the non-human animals and the human animal, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if you were the only ones that have thoughts. Yeah, I think, I think you're actually very correct in the sense that a lot of this stuff comes to us from about 50 to 100 years ago, when people were very interested in drawing the line, some sort of line between the human and the non-human animal. And so one of the things that was made to stand for that was, well, we're the only ones that have language. We're the only ones that can do this symbolic thought stuff. The other animals can't. That was before we taught a whole bunch of chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos how to do sign language. So that happened in the 1970s. I'm not sure that was a great idea. A lot of those creatures suffered greatly in conditions that were not good and then were put back into other conditions. And still to this day, I really wonder about it. But it did tell us that, you know, that that non-human animals, at least our, our close primate relatives, are capable of a, you know, a decent amount of uh, things like displacement. One of the first things that Washo, the signing chimpanzee, did is, you know, it was in some room and, and there was some chimpanzee poop over there and the trainer came in and said, you know, hey, who did the poop? And that Washo said that some, that the trainer did it. So obviously, the chimpanzee was capable of making up a lie. So, you know, the idea that only humans could talk about these things. Uh, this was probably taken the furthest in the bonobo Kanzi, who uh, uh, they were trying to teach uh, the mother of, of Kanzi uh, these, this pretty complicated sign language. And the mother reached a certain point, and Kanzi was up there playing around. And then they found out that Kanzi the little one had absorbed all this stuff and was had actually taken it much further and could do things like talk about an apple and 
as in wanting an apple and not just uh, you know, having to have an apple right in front of them. So we've started to, I think, uh, and, and I would say in a lot of societies, we don't, other societies don't necessarily see human speech as cut off from the world's nature in the way that people in uh, European and American societies have. And so a lot of people, or some people, uh, seem to be adopting a view that our specific, what we might call deep human symbolism, which is very powerful and very special, and, and we can do things that we, that even, even the, the uh, bonobos that we've trained the most aren't able to do, um, that it, it isn't that that sort of evolved from this call system, it's that it came a, along with it. And uh, in some ways you can, you can tell this because, because of the things that I'm doing and we all do when we talk, we gesture, we have tonal uh, variation, which in some languages uh, also counts as, as meaning. Uh, we do all kinds of things that it's very difficult to understand human language outside of the specific context. So that's to say that we, we kind of incorporate these close call or, or, or those things still are part of our lives. And the way we say things is as important as the, 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 uh, the words we use. So we still use a lot of what we might call shallow symbolism along with the deep symbolism as well. But human language is, you know, I mean, there, there are parts of it that are super special and, and in some ways unique to human beings. So without losing that connection uh, to the non-human animals, we can talk about, you know, the generativity of human uh, communication, that we can make lots of new sentences, new ideas. Again, talk about things in the past, present things that haven't happened, things that will never happen. Um, make new sentences, make new combinations. Uh, it leads to, uh, you know, the idea that there is no necessary link between the words that we use, the sounds that we have, and the actual uh, stuff that is out there in the world. So it's an incredibly powerful uh, system and, and people all around the world uh, have language and different kinds of language. And um, some of you were drawn to this section about languages today where they talk about the 7,000 different languages in the world or something like that. And I just wanted to say here that um, kind of, right into that is that it's sometimes difficult to draw a line and count up what exactly constitutes what a language is. And so uh, one of you pointed out that, as they say here, the definitions are in flux. That is to say, they are, uh, they, they are changing uh, as we try to define these languages. I want to point you to something that I thought was uh, an interesting idea here, which is the difference between what we might call a dialect and a language. And so a lot of people think of a dialect as simply a version of a, of a larger thing as a language. But um, the linguists are a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, circumspect about that. Uh, in 1945, Max Weinreich said, a language is a dialect with an army and navy. And what he meant by that is that oftentimes we have, say, mutually intelligible uh, languages, like uh, best example I guess I would give you is like Swedish and Norwegian, pretty close. You would possibly say that they were uh, dialects of each other, but because both of them have their own nations and their own nation state, they count them as different languages. Whereas uh, people talk about uh, Mandarin and uh, Cantonese, which are actually mutually unintelligible, you can't understand each other, they do share a writing system as being Chinese. And, you know, instead of counting perhaps as different languages, again, because there's always a component of power in there. 
And so, you know, whenever we're thinking about language and the kinds of language or languages people speak, we also have to think about this larger idea of you know, who defines languages. So uh, the other thing that has happened over time is that the, some countries, some nation states have made it seem like monolingualism is the basic human condition, that every people only speaks one language and then they add on another language later. And uh, I guess this is probably particularly true uh, in certain European, well, not in the European countries as much, I guess it's particularly true in the United States uh, where we are sort of fiercely uh, monolingual in a way that is, is probably not natural. I'm already picking on Timur. Timur, how many languages do you speak? Four, four different languages. You got your English and what? English, Russian, Uzbek, and Kazakh. Uh, is that typical of where uh, you would, you know, people in that area? More practical, yeah. So you've been in different different nations, yeah. But I guess I would say that in a lot of places, it's pretty typical to be able to converse in more than one language. You grow up like that. You grow up either bilingual or you grow up conversing with different people. It's only recently, actually, recently, I mean in the last two or 300 years, that people have insisted that monolingualism is the way to go or that that's the natural human way. Now we do this in the United States. I've probably told you about some of this before. We do this a lot in the United States where we make people speak one language. And so uh, just to talk about something that often comes up with immigration, for example, and the idea that certain groups of people are not learning English or they're not assimilating. This has been an accusation that has been levied against almost every uh, immigrant group, including especially my ancestors, the Italians, and for some of you Germans, they've been accused back, Ben Franklin did this of the Germans who lived in Pennsylvania back in the 1780s. And so he's like, they're not learning English, they're not assimilating. Every immigrant group, including the Spanish speakers or recent immigrants of today, uh, Asian origin uh, immigrants, uh, goes through the same process. Or we see them go through the same process. In the first generation, of course, they're going to speak the language or the languages of their origin country. The second generation is inevitably bilingual in English. And they may speak some or understand their parents. But by the third generation, almost always, they are almost always monolingual in English, perhaps with some sort of little touch of, a, of, of, their, of their grandparents. And you can look at this in almost any, uh, in almost any immigration pattern. So, uh, you know, Certain people have called the United States the la a language graveyard because it's where we go and people lose their language abilities over time. And so it's interesting because this happens whether or not your state has a, 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 an English only law. Uh, it happens in places like Los Angeles where you would expect with the, you know, the large Hisp Hispanic, Spanish speaking population that it wouldn't happen, still happens. Um, you know, I mean, it's happened happened to me. This is, uh, you know, my grandparents spoke Italian, but my father was could understand some Italian, could understand what they were saying, but couldn't couldn't really speak it. And then by the time I'm around, I got only English. My wife was, her parents came from, so she was. Her parents came from, from South Korea, spoke Korean, 
She grew up bilingual, can again understand her parents, but it's one of those things where, you know, they speak to her in Korean, she answers back in English and they kind of get along that way. Um, and then our kids are like Oneonta English only. It's like special upstate English kind of. So it's kind of sad. I wish, you know, I wish they could speak three or four different languages, but now I have to try and learn some French in school if you want any, any other languages. So we always have to be, pay attention to whenever we're thinking about these deep thoughts to kind of uh, the idea of language and power as well. All right, so let's turn to this idea of language and culture. What is the interrelationship? I think that it's safe to say that language and culture are tightly interconnected, that you can't imagine human culture and human cultural transmission without the role of language and symbolic, some role for symbolic uh, communication. And so there's a lot of things that we can say about the concept of, or the idea of culture, which we can completely see or, uh, or draw parallels to uh, the role of language. So the first thing I would say is that language, like culture, is patterned. There are things that have to recur and they have to be social in nature. You can't make up your own individual language. It is inherited. And of course you have to grow up and speak to your peers in it, but there has to be some sort of social aspect to it. It can't just be every individual, you know, doing their own thing. Of course, we all have our different styles, but in order to have any kind of communication at all, there has to be a common or shared patterning. Like we've been talking about a little bit, language is about thinking. There's obviously a huge aspect where we're trying to communicate, but it's also about organizing our thoughts. We'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a second, but language like culture gives us an, a way of perceiving the world, of organizing it, that can be, of course, very different in different places. And there's something that we should always, always remember about language like culture, which is, Sean, what should we should remember about language? Always, always. What's this always doing? Changing. Changing. Evolving. Yes. That's very extremely important. And it's important because a lot of people think that language or culture gets stuck and that some people sort of get stuck in their language or in their culture. Language is always changing in every generation. It adds, it subtracts, it evolves. It's always uh, going to be a dynamic thing. And we should always think about it as connected to other languages, dialects, styles of speaking uh, and variation within the language. A language that is cut off and isolated from other speakers, like a culture or a people that is cut off and isolated is probably not going to last very long. So again, we thrive as human beings on being interconnected, on being able to interact with other people, on being able to use uh, language uh, dynamically. Again, going with the deep thought idea, uh, continuing on, the superior warp hypothesis. What is this, Liz? Actually, Liz, you mentioned the superior war of hypothesis. What would you say it, it is about in general? Different places have Another 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's it's difficult. It's it's kind of difficult to sort of wrap our heads around it in some ways. I mean, I think that you know, I mean, I think that the best thing that that I can say about it, or I mean, I think that the, in the simplest terms is that both uh, Sapir and Worf, who were linguists of about you know 70, 80 years ago, and did some really interesting work both by themselves and together about the connections between how we our language shapes our world and the way we perceive things and our cultural possibilities. Now, I put the sapir Whorf hypothesis in quotes, not just because I'm quoting from the text, but because they never said, you know, they never actually came up with a hypothesis. This is something that people put on them later on about, oh, what they're saying is that language determines thought. Perhaps the nearest thing to uh, something that might be called uh, a hypothesis or what has been called linguistic determinism, determinism is a pretty strong statement from Benjamin War from 1939, in which he said that it's the language, that language is what limits our plasticity, our ability to change and rigidifies channels of development in the more autocratic way, which is pretty kind of harsh language. I guess 1939, people were very autocratic back then. But, um, you know, I think that this is one of his stronger, perhaps his strongest statement was the idea that our language is what then determines our culture and our cultural abilities. I guess I would say that, you know, I think that most, almost all, even linguists would agree that this the sort of strong linguistic determinism that the language sort of encases us in a rigid way of, of seeing and perceiving the world uh, has not been supported over time. That part of superior warp hypothesis, if you want to go into kind of what we might call hardcore linguistic determinism, has really not been supported. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. I mean, if it is true that everyone is encased in their own world of language, and those worlds are so different from each other that they can't correspond, then it would be very difficult to do anything that we do all the time, which is to make translations. Now, of course, translations are always really hard to do, and you may never capture the, the, the thought of the original person, but we do it, we're always translating. We're translating, uh, uh, even, if we, if, even if we say we speak the same language, we're going through that kind of translation process. And certain people are really good at kind of putting uh, words from other languages into our own words. So, you know, it'd be difficult to do this if everyone is so encased in their own world. Certainly anthropological field work would be almost impossible too. The other reason, I think that the sort of strong idea of linguistic determinism doesn't work is that there's so much variation within any particular language that we might try to draw a line around. And one of you talked about different forms of English, say, you know, British English, American English, Jamaican English, uh, and different forms of expression within that. So African American vernacular English, there's a lot of variation within those let those places that we might call languages or dialects, a lot of individual and group variation. And so to say that those speakers of that would be encased in their own world, where would you draw the lines? And then as we were talking about before, the human norm is to be at least bilingual, to be able to converse uh, in different forms uh, of perhaps of, of different languages. I put in was because in some ways that, like I said about the United States, we seem to be intent on getting rid of uh, different forms of speaking. So uh, while strong linguistic determinism has not been supported in recent years, in the last, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, 
there have been new ways to kind of try to test that Sapir-Whorf hypothesis out. Uh, and your text mentions the work of Lyra Borditsky, How Language Shapes the Way We Think, which Aaron remembered from so long ago. What do you remember, Aaron? Um, I'm so happy. So she talked about a little bit um, of the time and space complex. languages also went into how Russian speakers are able to perceive color, and color more um, accurately and more quickly than uh, other cultures because they have different words for different shades. Um, she also went into image of them in a, a museum who was backed up into a cage for something. Um, and obviously it broke. There's a difference in how people do name each other. So like in America, in English, we would say like the man broke the case. Um, but in Spanish, you would say like the case broke. Or the case fell. You would just apply the name to the person. Um, and that kind of changes how people think of them like in their culture and how um, you grow up with a different mentality towards them. Just bothers me about that. Something in there that I don't want you to leave this room thinking. Languages that don't have counting terms. Right, so there are languages in the world that you know you go to one, two, three, and then it's just many that she describes there. Now, let me put it to you this way almost all people in the world, again, have been exposed to more than one language, and almost all people in the world are experienced both their language and a language in which they are educated. So you know, there are no people who are like not counting in the world and can't do algebra and can't make stuff. That is actually not, not a thing. So that's the one thing that kind of bothers me about this is the idea that our language might make us able to build things. You might better put it that our language, our accounting language has made it possible that we have a humongous amount of inequality in the world because we're always counting our money. And some people are using that money to go off into space and some people are stuck here in this place. So I guess I would just say that's the one note of caution I would have about this is that, you know, it's, it's very easy to acquire a counting language or, you know, put those number terms into your, into your own language. Um, and we'll, we can all do, we can all do algebra if we need to. All right, this leads us to, we're starting now to talk a little bit more about you know the the idea of classification so i'm still picking on aaron you're a modern languages major which one uh, I spanish. spanish and french so maybe you can do this for me how would you say those words on the right side no. yeah. ah great one of the few French majors left in the world. What's the, so what I put up here is, is stream to river the same as those two? What's the difference between a stream and a river in our English world? Yeah, Scott. Generally a lot smaller. Streams are something you can hop over and rivers might be big, like the Amazon River, yeah, true. What's the difference in French? Um, in French, those words mean like they were interchangeably. Interchangeably, yeah. Some people try to make it seem like the flu, whatever those words are. I don't know, maybe this is, Maybe this isn't true of the French anymore, but uh, people say, some people say, or at least the, uh, the anthropologist Marshall Sullen said that actually 
The difference in French is that the flu flows, I guess I should have reversed those, flows to the sea that empties into the, the ocean or the, the, the water. And that, you know, the Riviera is, is just a tributary of that, which is something we don't even think about in English. Like which, does this, is this water flowing to the sea? You know, I didn't never think about it. Now, Solons is trying to make a joke here at the end the French are hung up on where the sea is, which may not be entirely true, but it's like, you know, we saw in the, in the, in the film, certain people are asked to organize the world differently because of their language and because of what their language helps them do or forces them to do or helps them to think about. And so this brings us back to uh, where the chapter began, which is about the idea of how we classify things in the world and in our lives. And humans are famous classifiers. We seem to want to put things into categories. Not everybody, but a lot of human groups like to, to put things into categories, to play around with those categories. And we get that through a process of socialization. We learn those categories. So in some parts of the world, we're going to learn that, you know, we, that we should distinguish between water that goes to the sea and water that just flows into other water. It doesn't go to the sea. Or we might learn that we should distinguish between what, you know, certain ideas about, uh, well, let's deal with the color stuff, which they talk about uh, on page 92. We might learn different words for different colors. Uh, interestingly, they use the example of a word that we might classify as brown, but among the Welsh, they, you can only use it for, you know, someone's hair, but you could never use it for some other object. So we use, we do different kinds of color classifications. It helps us to see and perceive the world differently. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the gender classifications and how we're in some languages very forced to make not just people, but objects and other things, we're forced to gender them uh, in some ways and how we've tried to escape some of those categories through, uh, through, through gender fluid uh, pronouns and those kinds of things. And it leads them to an idea that is sometimes introduced earlier on in, uh, in anthropological texts when we talk about culture, but here I think it's a good place for it, which is the idea of cultural relativism, which is that we spent a lot of time uh, trying to think that our classification systems mapped onto a natural or a biological or a God-given world in some way. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out well, what is, you know, why, you know, is there any sort of natural or biological basis to the way we think about human sexual variation and, and gender, for example. Um, and what we found, I think, in anthropology is people do this in a lot of different ways, and we learn how to do it. And the only way to understand what somebody else might be doing is from within their own learning or socialization process. And so we have to try to get inside, uh, you know, to try as best we can to understand another person's society from their own terms. And this brings us to the idea of cultural relativism. Now, in your textbook, I, I guess I would say that my being, the cultural relativism is a method that we use. It doesn't mean we have to say that every other way of doing things, we approve of it or that it's good. But what it is most importantly against is what we call ethnocentrism, believing that your way of life is the only natural, God-given, right way to live. And so, you know, it's, it's not so much that we're just going to sort of accept everything. Obviously, we don't. And in fact, we might want to criticize uh, things that are done uh, in other societies or in our own societies, uh, you know, like certain forms of body modification, skin bleaching and tanning uh, as being unhealthy, not good for us. 
Um, but we, before we do that, before we start critiquing others or within ourselves, we have to go through this process of trying to understand what the logic is from within or for people who have grown up uh, in that society. And that's where the idea of cultural relativism uh, comes in, uh, especially when it's counter, countered with or as a counterpoint to uh, ethnocentrism. Now this comes up uh, a lot when people are trying to, ex our classification when they're trying to explain stuff that happens in the world, especially I guess when they're trying to explain bad stuff that happens to them. And in a lot of different societies, well, let's see, Matt, what do people use to explain bad stuff that happens? Yeah, and if something bad happens to me, what might have caused it? Let's say I'm getting sick all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. We use the term bad luck. If you said someone did something to cause it, what might that be? Huh? Sabotage. Uh, are people able to sabotage you from a distance using special fluids and other things? Mm -hmm. We usually don't think so. That would be known as sorcery, right? Or as witchcraft. In many societies, uh, there are ways in which uh, what is sometimes termed uh, witchcraft is used to explain the kinds of things that we might pass off as bad luck. And so uh, this led to, I guess, you know, the idea that in, in those societies that were trying to explain these things as a result of sorcery or witchcraft, that they were somehow irrational, that they didn't understand the way that we should understand things. Tell us about this irrationality, irrationally, irrationality debate. Uh, like in the past, people would well, your like white Europeans would with philosophers, they would like draw a line in the sand and say, this line is important, and the line so happens like to be around themselves. <laughs> and then they looked at everything that's outside the line, and they were like, well, those people aren't inside the line, they aren't as important, they aren't as intelligent or rational or logical as us. And that's kind of stupid. <laughs> yeah, there was a sort of there was a, a movement that that attributed rationality and sort of these ideas about explanation that that was the sole occupancy of that was was uh, the Europeans. And if you if you explain things in different ways, then you were irrational or primitive or, you know, all those all those things. Um, there's uh, your text mentions the work of Evans Pritchard among the Azandi. And uh, I guess I've chosen to to show you uh, Lyra Boroditsky's video instead of a video called Strange Beliefs, which would talk a little bit about the ways in which at least uh, some people started thinking about this, uh, that were also part of European society, but started thinking about this a little differently. And Evans Pritchard uh, went and, you know, he was studying among society in which they explained things often by the use of of witchcraft. And I would say that, that this is uh, in a Zandi term, it does not mean the same thing as, as we would say in our society. And what he comes to, to understand is that the, those ideas were, were useful or helpful in explaining what we actually can explain, which is the why. And so, you know, we have certain ideas about disease and about the way it spreads but we can't explain, you know, well, why were we all exposed to the same thing? And why do some people get this thing and other people don't? Or why do some people have bad effects from this and other people don't? And these are sort of these deep human questions, which I would argue probably in a European and American society, we have the same sort of search for, well, why is this? And we often resort to equally what we might term irrational answers. <laughs> 
Uh, there's a very famous example uh, of this in which uh, in, among the Azandi, there, there are granaries which are held up by these posts. And uh, every so often termites would eat out the posts and the granary would fall. And there might be somebody sitting under it in the shade. And so, and, and the Azandi, according to Emerson Christian, would say, well, you know, if somebody gets hurt, well, that was a result of, of, of witchcraft. And he said, no, I mean, you know, the termites ate the post out and it fell. And they said, yes, we know the termites eat the post out. Of course, that's what causes this. But why was that person sitting under that thing at that time? That can only be explained by someone sabotaging them <laughs> from a distance. And so what he concluded is that there are, you know, that, that, that their thought was, in, we might say, equally rational, but they were trying to explain different things that, in fact, uh, we find very difficult to explain in our own society. So, like I said, I, 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 we chose to, to see the, the Lyra Boroditsky video, which I think is a decent choice. It is like early anthropological stuff. I'll send you the link if you want to look at it. The chapter ends with uh, something on technology and communication, uh, which is often an interesting, uh, an in interesting sections of things if you get to that point of the reading, because obviously many of what we might call our, our most our most biggest technological advancements in recent years have had to do with how we communicate with each other and uh, kinds of things. Um, they mentioned the anthropologist uh, Tom Bolstrup, who wrote a book called Coming of Age in Second Life, in which he did basically his field work within the confines of a multiplayer video game, which is probably gone away by now. There's different games, um, but there are some really interesting things to be done about, you know, the use of language and communication over video games. I know it's very different for me when I was growing up and video games were often a very solitary activity, uh, at least for my son. It's something where he's playing these games and they're like, constantly talking and yelling at each other all the time. It's like a stream of yelling and talking and all these things that you never would play a video game by yourself, in fact, which is, uh, which is quite uh, different and interesting. Coming of age in second life. Does everybody get the, uh, the anthropological, the, the reference here? Probably not. Coming of Age in Samoa was an extremely famous book by Margaret Mead, who is probably the most famous uh, US anthropologist, perhaps the most famous anthropologist of all time. Uh, her book during the 19, uh, 1920s and 1930s was her, her sort of uh, heyday work here. Um, her book really in some ways transformed ideas that Americans had about, uh, about sexuality and how it was experienced. Again, we often tried to think that our own ways of organizing the world were the only ways of doing things. And uh, she got a lot of, she took a lot of heat for this and a lot of people, it sort of caused these huge debates about whether she got everything correct or not. But her basic point was that people uh, had experienced the process of adolescence of coming of age quite differently in Samoa. And so our follow-up author, Coming of Age in Second Life, is uh, playing on something that uh, in the old days, everybody would have known this book because it was kind of, uh, it, was a, it was a bestseller. It was on, uh, Margaret Mead was actually a household name. Um, I think that in some ways, perhaps, uh, like Coming of Age in Samoa, our new uh, familiarity with digital and, and different ways of calling each other are uh, increasingly calling into question our, our, that, that rooting of sexuality, gender expressions uh, in this idea of biology that in some ways we're able to, to play with technology in different ways. So 